This podcast is brought to you by Cash App, the easy way to send, spend, save, and invest with friends. Does everyone in your friends group have a cash tag? That's money. And because Cash App connects you effortlessly with your friends and your finances, I would like to take this moment to shout out all the friends who are on Cash App. Shout out to the friend whose cash tag is learning to bake and to the one who helped you take your AC out of your window. A big shout out to the friend who owes you $38.42. Shout out to the friend who will only pay you back in Bitcoin and the one who always suggests theme restaurants. Shout out to the old friend who instilled a fear of mana rays in you that you can't shake. And I'd like to shout out my brother-in-law who constantly cash apps me the most ridiculous sums of money, $11.42 for a bagel and cream cheese that I bought him. He doesn't need to do that, Kylie but he does. This. Kylie <laughs> loves this shout out. We also uh, should shout out your new friend who recently started working in real estate and now says location, location, location all the time. Shout out to the friend who withhold repayment until you finally agree that who's the greatest of all time? Um, It's got to be Leo, right? We can do Leo for now. I think Leo <laughs> works. And to the friend who can't dance, shout out to the friend who sends gift reactions entirely too much for anyone's taste, JJ. And to the friend who thinks you're related. And to the friend who drew their cat on their custom cash card, shout out to you, sir. I am a giffer. Cash App is the easy way for you and all your friends to enjoy sending, spending, saving, investing, splitting, tipping, donating, gifting, or just pressing buttons to look busy, all with the number one finance app in the App Store. That's money. That's Cash App. Download Cash App from the App Store or Google Play Store today to create your own cash tag. Welcome to the Old Man of the Three with JJ Reddick and Tommy Alter, presented by Cash App and brought to you by 342 Productions. This is episode 135. Steph Curry. Steph will be joining us in a little bit here in Houston, Texas. Tommy, when you do the Mount Rushmore of the Old Man of the Three podcast, this has to be on the Mount Rushmore. I would say so. The I would say greatest we, episodes we've done. I would say when we started uh, this show, this was one that was on the bucket list. Yeah, as our first or second guest. I think the, I think the term is called white whales. Is that right? White white whales, like something you're you're chasing, something yep. you dream about. And I've got a list of three people. Uh, that are like my bucket list and have been since I started podcasting seven years ago. Uh, Steph has been on that the whole time. Uh, happy to have sat down with him a uh, night in between games here in Houston, Texas. I called the Warriors game last night, took the red eye after the game, got to Houston. You flew in last night. Jason came in from Oklahoma. We're here. We're getting this done. It's going to be awesome. Uh, so you called the game last night, like you mentioned. What'd you think? I, w I was really happy because Clay had a good game. And so much has been made about his struggles uh, going into last night. But he was solid, shot around 50% from the field, got off to a great start. It was interesting. Early in that game, Steph, I think, made a point to look for Clay to get everyone involved in the offense. We had the audio uh, you know, from Steve Kerr during different timeouts. And Kerr kept stressing, one more pass, one more pass, one more pass. And if you look at their like assist percentage last night, it was amazing. Steph, of course, ended up with 10 assists. Uh, this is a, in a game coming off a of 50 ball where, you know, maybe he comes out on a Friday ESPN game and tries to go ballistic, but he recognizes how important Clay playing well is to that team. Do you feel like being around the group, uh, there's still a level of, of calm? Obviously, the season has not started how they would have wanted to, or really how I think most people would have predicted. But this is none of these guys' first rodeo. Yeah, that's the thing that comes with winning at a high level and experience. Um, they're just a few months removed from winning an NBA championship. They've got to figure out their bench. They've got to act. I think they've got to add uh, some pieces to their bench. They 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 miss Otto Porter. They miss Gary Payton. You need guys off the bench that really just fit into that system and have a really high basketball IQ. Um, and truthfully, this is not a knock on Wiseman or Kaminga or Moses Moody. And th those guys, they haven't had enough basketball experience. And that's not an easy thing. You know, they're not getting the runs that the Houston Rockets young guys are getting. They're not getting the runs that the Orlando Magic young guys are getting. They're in a high pressure situation with a timeline based on Steph Curry, who is going to be 35 in a few months. And he's having an, an unbelievable season. season. I would actually yeah. argue. 
that he's having his best statistical season. Uh, going into last night, I didn't look it up today, but going into last night, Friday night's game against the Knicks, true shooting percentage of over 70%. Career high for him. Career high in points. Career high in rebounds. And this guy's doing it at such a high level. Better statistical season right now than his unanimous MVP year, by the way. Now, that team, of course, was 73-9. and nine. And so, where do you sort of assess his his you know likelihood that he could win another MVP? Well, the t- the team just has to improve. Yeah. They just have to. They just have to. First of all, they have to win a game on the road. <laughs> Second, yeah. secondly, they just have to. Uh, they just have to win more. I don't think they need to finish. You know, first in the West if he keeps this up. And I don't know where the where the spot they have to be to really put him in the conversation is. But they're not there. Right now, my question for you, we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, and I, and I want to hear your thoughts on him and the MVP, but just the difference between the starters and the bench on this team and how stark it is. I, this was from a couple of days ago. The starters are plus 77. The bench is at uh, minus 90. How is this even p- possible, A? <laughs> but B, is there, and this is a glass, you know, glass half full sort of way to phrase this question, is there a world where it's like if the bench just gets like marginally better, with how good the starters are, all of a sudden we're like, oh yeah, this is the team that won a championship last year. Yeah, so uh, Jordan Poole, when he subs in for Clay and sort of where he's the fifth starter, um, that group, uh, you know, hasn't been great. The group, the group with Poole for Kavon Looney hasn't been great relative to how you would expect those groups to perform. The one interesting thing in that sort of death lineup 3.0, uh, you know, Going into last night, at least Clay's three point shooting numbers, he was like five for 22. And if you just said, like, if Clay's shooting 35%, all of a sudden that becomes a plus unit. If Clay's shooting 45, 40% from with that unit, all of a sudden that's a really good unit. So I, I think some of this is small sample size. Um, I, you know, I think DiVincenzo has a chance to, to figure that out. He had some good moments last night. And I think Jamichael Green has some good moments last night and has has a chance to figure that out. In terms of the MVP right now on DraftKings Sportsbook, Steph is currently ranked fourth in the MVP race with odds of plus 900. Right now, he's behind Luka Doncic, Giannis Antetokounmpo, and Jason Tatum. And I think that's fair. He's ahead of guys like Joel Embiid, John Morant, Kevin Durant. Um, But I, I think... Doncic, Antetokounmpo, Tatum, that's fair. Tatum right now, the Celtics are on a burner, nine straight wins. Tatum's playing unbelievable. Giannis, of course, two-way brilliance, and and Luka is basically the Dallas Mavericks. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, don't you think, you know, he and Luka are in similar positions if you were to sort of judge them right now, and they're both having these great seasons, but the team is, uh, you know, has been hit or miss compared to Milwaukee and Boston? Yeah. Uh, Milwaukee and Boston uh, right now, have looked like the most complete teams. And of course, Milwaukee without Chris Middleton still. So there's a chance they go on a run if he's back and healthy and playing well. Um, The really interesting thing, you know, for, I I think you're right on the MVP race. I think for Steph to really be in the conversation at the end, the Warriors have to be a top three or top four team in the Western Conference. DraftKings Sportsbook still loves them to win the Western Conference. They're tied with the Clippers right now with the best odds to win the Western Conference at plus 350. So that will be an interesting thing to play out over the season is where do the Warriors stack up? If Steph continues this dominance and this brilliance, he may have a chance at that third regular season MVP. As always, see the show notes for details on DraftKings. Uh, Without further ado, let's get to this awesome, awesome conversation with Steph Curry. All right, let's welcome in the executive producer of Holy Moly, Steph Curry. <laughs> Steph, thanks so much for joining us. I appreciate it. You wouldn't, you'd be surprised how much I get that on the, <laughs> yeah, out in the, out in the, out in the wild and how many people love that show. So appreciate the love. Four seasons, right? Yeah, we're already, already locked in for five. Yeah. Shout out to Rob Riggle, Joe Tessator. My Good guy. for you. <laughs> Tommy, I haven't told you this story yet, but I want to start the podcast with a quick story. So. We've been trying to get Steph on the pod for a while. There's been some some near 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 misses. <laughs> at all, you know, he's a busy guy. I get it. So I'm doing the game last night in Golden State, and I was actually trying to get Jalen Brunson's attention, but I was like looking around the court. And I made eye contact with Steph, and he gave me a head nod, 
He dribbles over to center court. And RJ and I stood up. And the first thing he says to me, he goes, <laughs> hey, uh, did we ever get that podcast on the books? <laughs> And the look, the look on you. I had this moment of panic. <laughs> to provide context, I was immediately going to the airport after the game to fly to Houston to meet Steph here. Jason was flying in today from Oklahoma City. Tommy was flying in from LA. We'd booked rooms. I was like, oh shit. And I was like, it's tomorrow. And you're like, oh right, Houston. RJ thought that was funny. <laughs> he, he loved that one. He apparently uh uh, yes, I had a conversation about it on the way to the game and the whole deal. Like, I'm, I'm hoping we can lock this in because it's been a long time coming to get it on the schedule. But I had to, I had to take advantage of the moment. I, I, <laughs> I, I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time because uh, we have so much to get to. But I don't want to spend too much time necessarily on this year's team. But you know, a big takeaway last night in watching the game was Clay's play, and he's a guy who's struggling right now. Were you at the beginning of that game? Were you? focused on sort of finding him because i thought initially it looked like you were very much in facilitator role yeah that's part of like the beauty of how we play and what we do it's all predicated on like creating the easiest shots possible because we have um uh, you know the chemistry the right talent to be able to leverage like my playmaking space and all uh, gravity if you will um and get everybody going there's certain times and kind of you just feeling out the flow of the game where you want to be a little bit more assertive on getting the ball moving and getting Clay some easy shots early because that changes the whole dynamic of the game. I told him the his superpower, obviously, is shooting the basketball, but he's such a threat, even in whatever percentage he's shooting right now, when his two feet are on the floor and he's out there, like people worry about him. So, you know, trying to let the game come to him, but for me just to be able to, you know, kind of figure out how to get him some some easy shots early, get his confidence going. You could tell how much our crowd fed off of it uh, early, and then that changes the whole dynamic of the game. So whether he's making a mission shots is more so just about, um, you know, warrior basketball, if you will, kind of getting uh, – being assertive on that front early. And obviously I have the ball in my hand, so I get to kind of dictate what that looks like. I uh I want to get something out of the way, and I should have maybe done this first before I gave I gave Holy Moly a shout out. Um, you're aware that you have you have stands, right? You have a very loyal fan base, okay? And you know this because I told you this the very last time I played against you. You and Ray Allen are the only two guys that I ever asked for a piece of memorabilia from. And I said, Hey, man, this is the last time I play against you. Can I get your jersey after the game? Sign it. You were nice enough to do it. Appreciated. Um. And but there's these these you know Steph Curry fans that think that I'm uh, a hater, like I'm a Steph hater. And how'd you piss them off? That's what I want to know. <laughs> See, this is you're being an asshole. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is what it is. Because you you see everything. You see what, everything. I, what I, th I think is mostly everything. Yeah, yeah. You pretty much see everything. No, I think it's really hit its head, hit, sort of hit like a culmination when i was asked on first take who would you rather have in the clutch luca or steph oh yeah and first take is very much a black and white thing you can't really live in the gray right <clears throat> so i i chose luca um and I, the, my gist of it was he's got more size and this year his clutch stats are better that was the gist of it and for like six Damn, you did it on like 10 games of the <laughs> <laughs> No, this is last season. Oh, this last season. Okay, season. This was like during the playoffs <laughs> oh, okay, last okay, season. Okay, I just okay. literally, I was like, it was like one of those five minute segments, and I was like, I'm gonna go look up clutch stats. <laughs> Very just rational argument here. Yeah, I'm like, yeah, oh, yeah. Lucas slightly better. All right, that's the thing. Do you feel like you've always been that way, where you've seen everything, or did you develop that? Uh, I think I developed it mostly trying to rationalize the chaos of like that five year run that we were on. Um, you know, making the finals, you know, really not knowing. Like that first finals appearance, you have no idea what that level is like till you get there. And uh, just the amount of attention, scrutiny, the mood swings and narrative changes from game to game and all that. And I was like, I'm active on social media, but not really. But you kind of like live your life the same way you have been, you know, your, your entire career. And then things just change overnight. And you're like, yo, what the hell is happening? There's... Uh, 
uh, way more conversation, way more hot takes and all type of uh, kind of conclusions about your game. And, you know, you got your stands out there to defend you. You got people that are going to hate on anything that you do. And before you go through it for the first time, like at that level, you have no idea how you're going to respond. And I found that it's nice to be aware of what's going on um, and also develop a sense of like comfortability in who I am um, because you're going to get asked about stuff. You're going to have – it's 82 games and nine months of your life. And even now the NBA is 24, 24, seven, 365 news cycle. Um, you want to be aware of what's going on, but I'm also so secure in like who I am and what I, what I can do on the floor that it doesn't, I'm more, it's more entertainment at this point because it is our world. It is, you know, what we do and, you know, it's how the team responds to all this stuff throughout the year. So it's nice to know what's going on and have a good laugh and some stuff. But, uh, Develop that over that five year run where you're just on that, you know, on everybody's mind in the basketball world every day kind of, kind of, uh, I think it was Iguadala, but I believe he said that if you have a bad shooting first half, <clears throat> you go on Twitter to read the comments. That was, I, I, Is started, that true? I started that during that run. Yeah. Uh, Bo, uh, Andre, Andrew Bogut was the first one that kind of called me out on That's it. That's right. It was Bogues. And, uh, um, and he, he, it's funny because he he actually was kind of bold enough to ask me like, "What are you?" And went in the locker room like, "What are you looking at right now?" I'm like, "On my phone." And that's the thing between the errors. Like I've heard like KG got pissed off at everybody who even brought their phone in the locker room to, you know, ours is a pretty loose locker room. Like everybody's either looking on your phone before before the game, before the coaches meeting, in between, and all that type of stuff. Like as long as you come with the right mindset when you're out on the floor. You know, nobody really cares about that. But for me, like it, it was, I was looking at Twitter and looking at uh, uh, some of the, I'll call it hateful messages, but real strong opinions on how you're playing and all that based on, we call it first quarter Twitter. Like it's the best, it's the best thing in the world. Like all oh, the Warriors suck. We're down six at the end of the quarter. And then third quarter happens. And you're like, all right, you know, you, you kind of get off on that a little bit. So I enjoy it. Did you ever have any of those that, that were like particularly crazy or like threw you off at all? You like saw it and you just couldn't believe it? Probably it's hard to pick one example. More so I started to make it a game. Cause people would tell me like do stuff in the second half. And I like, like uh, one of our beat writers, um, Kareth Burke, it's probably three years ago. She's like, Hey, if you see it, she wrote on Twitter. Hey, if you see this at halftime, like next time you score, like run down with like, like an airplane arms. <laughs> 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 so, like little something like that and i read it and i was laughing didn't think none of it i made my first shot come out the uh, halftime and i literally did it <laughs> she loved it so, <laughs> little stuff like that you just have fun with because it's a long season man i gotta i gotta try to have some fun as much as possible is is there is there motivation in this i mean i i get i think as human beings right we whether we're secure or not i think having some level of awareness about <clears throat> The narrative around you, especially if you're a public figure, I think that's totally normal and totally healthy. <laughs> but no, I do. I don't have it at your level, obviously. I think it's totally normal. Um, but do you use any of that as as motivation, or is it just is it just fun for you? It's both. Because um, I don't you know, you, amount of games you've played. Like sometimes the regular season, it's hard to to get up it's hard to find uh you don't ever want to be complacent in what you're doing and me i just i love the entertainment value of it because you know it's part of the game it's part of being in the nba it's part of the show it's part of you know the, the career arc that you have from when nobody expected anything to when you're surprising everybody to now they're kind of numb to what you do and almost kind of take it for granted so there's a lot of elements that go into it um it's kind of like a long arc of you know that's 14 years in the league you can imagine the wild stuff i've read the wild takes that i've heard about myself um the, the times you surprise yourself at what you do on the floor and the fact that you can get through 82 games every year and uh look forward to a long playoff run and everything that comes with it i do feel like when it's all said and done i'm gonna miss that part of it because it is such a kind of a you know an emotional roller coaster I, uh, speaking of celebrations, when, when I'm not hating on you, <laughs> I've, I've often, <laughs> I've, I've often said, I've often said that you are 
the greatest show on earth in terms of the entertainment value, uh, the joy that you play with, and the joy that you get as a fan in watching you. And obviously, part of that is the way you guys play. If you're a basketball purist, there's something very beautiful about seeing the ball move side to side. But the celebrations are really interesting to me. To me. My oldest, Knox, uh, just started playing. So I go to his practices and I go to his games. And I mean, Jesus Christ, man. It's after every every <laughs> single point. Somebody's doing this. Somebody's doing a Dude, shimmy. shimmy. Somebody's doing LeBron push down. I see, I like these kids are four foot four and they're doing the too small <laughs> to each other. It makes no sense. The one I wanted to ask you about though was is the look away three. Like yeah. wh- where did that do you remember the first time you did it in a game? Yeah, it was uh I want to say it was, it was either game three or game four of uh, our first playoff series against Denver in 2013. And uh, it was the third quarter. I went on this crazy run. I think I had like 20-something in the, in the quarter. And one of the last threes was right in front of Denver's bench. Um, backstory, I had always heard about how amazing Oracle Arena was during the playoffs. We believe team a couple of years before we, or was it 2007 when we, uh, when they, they made that run to beat Dallas, uh, almost beat, you know, uh, Utah after that. I'd heard like that, this, this is the crazy, it's already the craziest arena and it's loud and regular season and all that, but the playoffs is just a different vibe. So we got into that series. We started it, we were six seed, so we started in Denver, came back 1 1, and, uh, it's like we walked out and there's this haze around over the court. Fans were like 75% full 20 minutes before the, uh, before the tip off. They're chanting Warriors. It's got a nice, uh, aroma in the, in the building. Um, it was just amazing, like amazing atmosphere. So you kind of get wrapped up in that. And then, uh, third quarter happened and we go on this crazy run. I have, you know, uh, uh, knocking shots down left and right. And the last kind of one in the third quarter. Right in front of uh, Denver's bench, JaVale McGee standing, like literally standing up. The whole, there's about five or six guys around him and uh, get the ball in the corner. And they're, like, obviously, you've been in that situation where you, you rise up and everybody's just talking, you know, trash behind you. And uh, for some reason, I just got an out, out of body experience. I shot it and literally, as it let go, it was like I never felt the shot feel better than that. And I turned around and kind of looked at JaVale and then just ran off and it went in. And that was when I didn't even check to see if it went in. I just was waiting for the waiting for the noise, and it was a uh, it was kind of really special moment. Just I don't know the uh, irrational confidence to even try that in a playoff game, but it was dope. I was gonna ask uh, before this, what do you get more joy out of? Like when you guys are one of those crazy runs with where where Oracle or Chase is going nuts, or when you're in a visiting an arena and you're just ripping their heart out. I mean, they all, uh, being at home and and being in that kind of a, a run and feeling that adrenaline rush, it, there's nothing like it. Because um, you feel like 19,000 people feel like just, I don't know, it's it's hard to explain, but that's something that uh, I think I enjoy the most, especially because of the way, like J.J. said, because of the way we play. Usually that means the ball's humming all over the place. Everybody's feeling good, you know, kind of walking with your chest out. And it's just a fun way to play basketball on top of the atmosphere. Like silence in the home crowd is dope and you hope to have as many opportunities to do both, but being at home is special. Have you ever missed one of those shots in a game? Yes. <laughs> I'm sure somebody could put a YouTube uh, compilation, compilation of that together. <laughs> but you, you ever see, uh, uh, I don't know if um if Knox is it, the fake hustle uh part of his game yet, where you know you just do like the all out sprint back on defense. <laughs> <laughs> but that's my favorite when I just do it. I half turn. I'm like, that's probably not going. And then you kind of look back and I miss, and then it's a haul ass down, yeah. getting defensive position. Like, oh, right, I'm locked in. Move on, next play. But yeah, I've done. I'm, I'm I, if I had to guess, I'm probably like. 80, 85 percent. That's good. Yes. <laughs> that's good. I mean, that's not bad. On that's the, not on. bad. In a live NBA game. That's fine. <laughs> I did it. So 15 and 16 was, was when I felt like my body and shoulder and mechanics and like my legs were probably the best in my career. Cause I had a little shoulder thing after 16. 
Um, I'd never shot the same. I, it was like a scapula thing, and it, I would raise my shoulder. It was weird. But those two years, I would do it occasionally. Um, not as frequently you as you You can explain did. how good it feels, though, because there's a reason you th do it. There's a reason you do it, <laughs> because it, it feels the biomechanics of it are just so perfect. And because you've shot, thousands and thousands of shots you know the feeling of when it's perfect it's it's the, it's it's not always a swoosh sometimes it's the one that hits kind of the back rim where the yeah. net doesn't the larry, even move the larry bird make yeah that's the, the net doesn't even move that's yeah. the the best make there is yeah but i did miss one one time and i don't know why i did this because i did it on a pull-up like 17 footer <laughs> <laughs> it was like we were playing minnesota and i was like it was like a random january game in the third quarter like it didn't even it was a meaningless shot <laughs> i missed it and i was like why did i fucking did anybody did call you out on it oh yeah okay. you know cpc's okay. everything <laughs> 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 um, the, the, the confidence you, you said irrational confidence. So I'm using your words here. Um, that irrational confidence. I think the world was sort of introduced to that during that Davidson run your sophomore year. Did you always have that irrational confidence as a player? Funny you say that there's a, uh, nice documentary coming out called underrated that, uh, um, we're launching in January. Um, but it kind of documents the, before during and after the davidson run and a big part of it is you know the i was just, i was a late bloomer as a, as a as a basketball player as a scrawny skinny kid on the end of the bench until the until the team ran zone and they put me in to be a zone buster type vibe all the way through high school like i was kind of a pass first play making point guard that coach my parents Sometimes teammates had to always tell me to shoot more because it just wasn't the way I saw the game, even though I knew I could shoot. Um, but that kind of came forced uh, when I got to Davidson because we had an amazing point guard there named Jason Richards, who was team captain, team leader, voice of the team, and was an unbelievable uh, setup guy. So I had to play the two, and it kind of unleashed that element he like he made my life a lot easy, really easy uh when i got to college because i could run around screens and the way that we played is you know motion offense and all that and so uh i kind of got wrapped up in that experience and it kind of unleashed a new way of you know playing the game that's very similar to how i do it now so um yeah i didn't really have there's a clip of me and my brother and we were in toronto when i was 12 shooting before the game and we're i'm like shooting from half court and as a, you know, I got the little holster shot that I used to have back then. And I tried to shoot all type of stuff. When I got in the game, it wasn't really that type of vibe of what you see now. So the, it, it's kind of an evolution. I just, like you said, the amount of reps that you put in, the deserved confidence of, you know, being able to go out there and take some chances, you know, play with a little bit of creativity, continue to surprise yourself and push the envelope and then really never, uh, lose that spirit, no matter how, you know, uh, deep you get into your career because I've always felt like I'm still on that on that journey. Did you have a favorite of those tournament games? Probably the Georgetown game, uh, just because I think the first one was just special because we got our coach's first college, you know, our first NCAA tournament win, and you know he just retired after 33 years of running uh, Davis the program coach Bob Akillip and to get him that first win was was amazing but the second game we played um we played Georgetown they were the second seed and we were down 16 in the second half and came back to beat them uh that was I'll never forget that that energy in the building because there was a lot of Carol uh, UN Tar Heel fans in there and Georgetown had beat uh, Carolina the year before uh, in the tournament so we kind of had a pseudo home game because everybody hated Georgetown in the building including the Carolina fans and uh, you know to be a 10 seed and be a 2 seed and go to Sweet 16 uh, was special so that was probably my favorite for sure. The next game the uh, the Sweet 16 game Wisconsin. I think that was that was the game Braun was at right? Yeah. Um, Yo, we used to have, we had witness shirts and they were like red witness <laughs> shirts. This is crazy. <laughs> this is this is what's this is what's wild to me because, I like at the time it's like oh this great story about this college kid at this small school you know Dell's son or whatever and LeBron is at his game. I want to kind of try to understand your mindset at the time. I mean, I don't know if you thought like I'm going to league, I'm going to be an all star. 
could you ever have imagined playing against Braun <laughs> in the finals five straight times at that point? Nobody will ever believe it. It's just because that's to your, you, it's a great question. That's exactly, I wouldn't, after we lost in the Elite Eight to Kansas, even at that point, I still wasn't thinking about the league. Like the first question I got in the locker room after the game was like, Hey, you declaring for the draft? I was like, what? <laughs> what are you talking? Like we're in here crying, like mad we lost. And I'm, it's the first time I really kind of contemplated like that would be, uh, like that was the time. I obviously I knew that that was the end goal, but it wasn't a means to an end type of situation. So to be in the tournament run and, uh, I wish y'all could have been like on our team bus, like driving up to, uh, or, in in Detroit, going back and forth from the game, and you hear these rumors like, "Hey, I think Bron's coming to the game." Like, what? <laughs> like, yeah, they're playing Detroit later. He was, he asked uh, somebody called the Davidson uh, uh, staff for some tickets for Bron to sit in our section. They're like, what? Like, what are you talking about? This this is right. You know, it was probably his fourth year in the fourth year in the league, and so uh, nobody believed he'd show up. And then we get to the forward field. And lo and behold, like right when the tip off is coming, here comes Rich, Brian, uh, I was trying to think who else was over there. He had like five or six people and, you know, he's there just being a fan and watching us play. So to think fast forward, you know, six years later, we'd be playing against each other in the finals and all that. It's kind of, it's just a wild experience. I still have, uh, in my, uh, Dad's house in in North Carolina. I still have a Bron jersey on the wall in my bed in my bedroom. Uh, he signed the next year. He uh, he came to Charlotte and I went to the game and he signed a jersey and uh, it's like the greatest shooter in North Carolina or something like that. And he wrote and signed it and I kept it. Um, gave me the shoes after the game and all that. So it's still wild just to think about the journey since then. Because uh, who would have ever thought that? Before we move on from sort of the Davidson stuff, um, how lightly were you recruited? Because there's all these different stories about who did offer you, who didn't offer you. Virginia Tech offering you a walk-on spot where your dad played. Like, was Davidson the option? Was the, was that the only option, or, the, or were there uh, other like there bigger schools? Two, on my my list, it was uh, Davidson, Winthrop, and Virginia Commonwealth. So Jeff Capel was at uh, VCU at the time. Greg Marshall was at Winthrop, and uh, that was the list. It was and it was during my senior year too. So <laughs> we we're like about to we we're in the middle of preseason. Like I think I declared I gave a verbal commitment to Davidson probably the first of December. So we're, it was pretty late in the process. But uh, fast, like it's crazy to think Davidson was always at the top of the list just because I knew Coach McKillop. Um, they were graduating seven seniors, uh, my, my senior high school. So I knew the way that he pitched, like you could, you got to earn it, but you have an opportunity to play right away. And that kind of excited me just about getting my feet wet early and not have to play behind anybody, no matter what level it was. And, uh, just the fit of the, you know, his style of play and all that. But, God has a funny sense of humor. Like that was my list. And as soon as I declared for, uh, or declared to Davidson after that, uh, that season, Greg Marshall went to, uh, Wichita state and Jeff Cable went to Oklahoma. So they both left, not because of it, I didn't come, but that was just you know, like, I would have signed up to two schools that, uh, both coaches would have left. So it's kind of just, uh, the timing and kind of the fortune of that, that, um, I had a, a coach that was going to bring the best out of me. I had a uh, a program that was technically a mid major, but had not really had much success on the tournament, you know, stage. So I kind of could develop under the radar and just go through the the ups and downs of becoming a college basketball player and building my confidence. So you were mentioning this earlier, but your your thought process between sophomore year and junior year about going to the draft or not? Why did you decide to come back after? You know, at that point, the whole world sort of knew who you were and what you could do. Part of it is just such a natural process to like the journey of, you know, freshman year, you're just getting your feet where you're playing well. I was trying to chase KD and the freshman uh, scoring title and all that. He beat me. Uh, then he declares for the draft. And I come back. We have that tournament run. And that's really all you're focused on. Like, I'm not thinking about the NBA. It's just how can we, you know, take that next step as a team. 
then right after the tournament, I spent the next two months kind of gathering some information and really thinking about like, is this something that is the right time for me? Uh, is my, the way, is my game, my, you know, physical stature ready for, to make that jump into the league? And what I kind of came to was, for me to be successful on the on the NBA level uh, and give myself the best chance was to come back and play more point guard role because, like I said, I had Jason Richards, who's the main ball handler, and I was just coming off screen shooting. I played a little bit of like backup point when he went to the bench, but I needed a whole season to kind of rep that um, or get some reps as, as a point guard, a playmaker, but still keep my you know my scoring thread up. And that's all that next year was knowing I was going to get attention from all type of crazy defenses and all that. That one coach run a triangle and two just on me for. Oh, I watched 40, 40 that year. I'd be like, man, I'm like, what is this guy doing in college right now? <laughs> like, this is not. I actually, my thought that whole year, cause I probably watched five or six of your regular season games. Yeah. And I was like, I don't know that this is preparing him for the NBA. <laughs> <laughs> I was there just coming down, run a play, no triangle. You get off, he's, you know, getting the ball back, just shooting. Um, but it was more so just, you know, being a, uh, having the ball in my hands to, to balance playmaking and scoring. Um, we didn't even make the tournament my junior year. We lost to, uh, we lost to, uh, St. Mary's in the NIT, uh, which is also kind of ironic because that's in Walnut or out or, uh, Moraga, California, which is 20 minutes from Oracle Arena. So my last game was literally in my new home and had no idea. So it was dope. Getting stuck in Black Friday crowds, super uncomfortable. Shopping Tommy John's Black Friday sale from your couch, super duper comfortable. When you give your loved ones Tommy John, they're that much more comfortable so they can do everything better. Shop Tommy John's Black Friday sale right now and give the gift of comfort to everyone on your list, including yourself, with brand new Tommy John underwear, loungewear, and pajamas. With over 18 million pairs sold, giving Tommy John has become a holiday tradition. 97% of women and men love getting a gift from Tommy John. That's why Tommy John doesn't have customers, they have fanatics. I actually love wearing my Tommy John underwear, but I've discovered something. The loungewear is actually next level. I love it. It's super soft. Your loved ones will love it too. So celebrate softness season with the gift of Tommy John underwear, loungewear, and pajamas. And every gift is backed by Tommy John's best pair you'll ever wear or it's free, guarantee. Shop Tommy John's Black Friday sale going on right now and get 30% off site-wide at tommyjohn.com slash JJ. 30% off everything now at tommyjohn.com slash JJ. tommyjohn.com slash JJ. See site for details. The NBA season is heating up and there are still so many unknowns, like who will be in the play-in game? I think the Sacramento Kings are there. Shout out Kings fans. When I'm looking to get in on the action, I bet with DraftKings Sportsbook, an official sports betting partner of the NBA. New customers can bet just $5 pregame money line on any NBA team to win their game and get $150 in free bets if they do. And get this. Right now, everyone can earn up to 100% boost with DraftKings stepped up same game parlays. Go to the DraftKings Sportsbook app, place the same game parlay, and combine multiple bets like which team will win, total rebounds, and more. The more legs you add, the bigger the boost, the bigger your shot to win big. The app is super easy to use. It's very intuitive, and building same game parlays is one of the funnest experiences of my week. I got to be honest with you. Download the app now, sign up with the code JJ, place a $5 pregame money line bet on any NBA team to win their game, and get $150 in free bets if they do. That's code JJ, only a DraftKings Sportsbook. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. See show notes for details. You're obviously. Uh, you know, uh, a mature, um, thoughtful, sometimes no mature, <laughs> thoughtful, um, person who I, I, I assume you have a lot of like reflection time in your life to think about this incredible journey that you've been on. Do you ever think about what ifs, the what ifs in your career? All the time, and probably leading me to the uh, had I got drafted by New York instead of Golden State or Minnesota, even um, had they picked me, not uh, Johnny Flynn or Ricky Rubio. So definitely think about all that. Even you know the ankle injuries early, uh, the Monte Ellis trade, like 
you know in the league there's Stan Stan versus Steve. <laughs> that part too, which is crazy. And I didn't even want Mark to get fired. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so like there's a lot of fortune in this league. There's a lot of uh you have to have an awareness of what's going on to appreciate, you know, the journey in real time. Because if you fight it, like sometimes you kind of, you know, you miss your window. Um, but then there's a lot of trust too. And, you know, specifically Bob Myers, who, you know, since I've my second, third year in the league, since he came on in the fray and the way that he's approached the job and, you know, the good decisions that he's made and, and, and thinking, and, you know, bringing coach Curry in, which was a really like tumultuous conversation situation. Cause, um, I was fighting it like hell. <laughs> like I did not, not against Steve. I didn't want them to fire Mark for, uh, for anything. And that he, he loves the, the conversation that we ended up having. He's like, I'll trust you to, you know, if this is what you think is right for the team, but don't mess this up. And that's one of his favorite lines that he, I said to him, um, uh, not knowing who they were going to hire and all that, uh, to help us get to the next level. So when Steve comes in and we win a championship the next year, but, uh, Definitely reflective on all those, you know, all the context of that and just the teammates that you play with because uh, that is a stuff that you remember. I, you know, on the Knicks front, it's sort of like when I think about um, if LeBron had gone to college, when I was in school, when Dwight came out of high school and I know Duke was recruiting him and I think about like certain players in certain arenas, like Dwight Howard dunking in Cameron Indoor <laughs> Stadium. <laughs> no, I'm serious. LeBron playing like in a in a, like an ACC conference game and like taking off from just inside the like you think about that stuff and I because of that MSG performance when you had that was sort of your coming yeah. out party in the NBA not that you weren't a good player before that but that was you know 54 points 11 threes and you think about like Steph for the last 14 years in MSG not that Oracle is not great that's that's why it's like it's so interesting to me. By the way, I looked it up. Your first game in MSG. I don't know if you remember this. Was November well, of your rookie West, year? Uh, you played two minutes and thirty five seconds and didn't score. That's my one of my. I tell the young guys. That's uh, even the crew we have now. I had to go through the ropes too. That was Don Nelson put me in the rookie dog doghouse, and uh, <laughs> it's funny too because that game I didn't play at all. He put me in like the last two minutes. I got a block on David Lee. Uh, he came baseline and I trapped the box. I I can't. I'm not gonna meet him at the rim. I timed it right where I kind of got up above him and um, I'd be I was like, get that shit down. And he uh, he looked at me and we went in transition and he came up like nose and nose at me and like said something to me. He's like, who's this freaking rookie coming out here playing garbage time talking trash? Then the next year we're teammates. <laughs> <laughs> Just amazing how the league works, but yeah, I was I rode the pond for a little bit more here. Is, is it true draft night that that you almost got traded to Phoenix? Yeah, so I, so this is, uh, I mean, the NBA is such a small world. Steve Kerr was the GM of Phoenix at the time, um, and part of the conversation leading up to the draft was, I guess, Golden State didn't think I was going to be around at seven, and whoever they drafted was going to be part of some trade to get Amari. Uh, to go state and then as the draft was unfolding i think phoenix loved it even more because they were like oh we're gonna get stuff now he can play behind steve nash for a little bit learn the ropes and then uh larry riley who's a gm of the warriors at the time don nelson i guess changed the tune in terms of as the draft unfolded i was i was there at seven so they drafted me and and kept me. I don't know all the different conversations that really happened on that front, but I know that that was a, a kind of a foregone conclusion going into the draft, and things changed. So kind of crazy that Steve was a part of that, and then five years later is now coaching me. My uh, Knox, who I mentioned, and Kai, my youngest son, um, they're they've gotten really into watching NBA YouTube highlights, and every morning they come downstairs, they watch the top ten, and anytime. Somebody like like Kevin Durant crossed Daniel Gafford the other day yeah. and he fell. Anytime that ever happens, Kai, my youngest, would be like, Dad, you made Steph fall. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, every time. <laughs> Only reason I thought of that was because you brought up the Mark Jackson. We beat you. It was game seven in the 2014 yeah. series. And <laughs> what's, 
What's crazy is I didn't even put a move on you. I just literally, <laughs> I've always wanted to ask you this. I really have. So I, I'm like, you're in help position. I'm on the left wing. I think it was CP just swung it to me. And your momentum was going this way. And I just drove away against your momentum. And then you hit the deck. <laughs> I made the shot. But I'm like, I still haven't figured out how you felt. <laughs> hey, man. I wish I knew too, because I wouldn't have done it. But I, <laughs> it was it was payback. It was payback. I think it was game. So I say this too. This is, this is hilarious. We're having this conversation now because my defensive presence was always like the question mark, especially in the playoffs. I was going to get picked on all the time and all that. So I started to have that like that little brother kind of syndrome of. Uh, like, yo, I stop picking on me, man. Like, I'm trying my hardest. Like, I'm out there giving effort, trying to get better. So anytime I had any type of defensive play, like, you see, like, my heart come out of my chest. I'm like, ah, yeah. I'm, like, looking at the bench and doing the whole thing. So I got to stop on you in game six, I think it was. Um, I actually got a block. So the part of it was, like, I had, like, this reaction. It wasn't even about a shot. I was like, I got to stop. Yeah, like, now what? <laughs> it didn't matter who it was. So I was, like, yelling, like, Flexing at the crowd, doing all that stuff, but uh, then I got humbled. <laughs> <laughs> no, you I got humbled. I, I think I yeah, I drove left over across from your bench in the left corner, and you, you thought it's in, in fairness to me, shot clock was winding down. I had to get up. <laughs> hey, you, that's when your best moves come out when you're free. You're like, you know, you gotta, you gotta you gotta do something. That's true. <laughs> uh, we talked a lot about uh, with Draymond when we had him on uh, about a year ago. This was not the live show, but back in January, we talked about. Um, cause I don't really consider it a, a rivalry cause we never won at anything of significance, <laughs> but we talked about that, that Clipper stuff, uh, Clippers warrior stuff for those few years. Um, so I don't want to get too much in that. There's two plays I want to talk about though, okay. which happened within a month of each other in 2014. Okay. Um, so the first is we're in the baby blues with the t-shirts in, in golden state. Uh, I think it's Matt Barnes, Chris Paul, Spencer Hawes, Deandre Jordan. I'm shouting out all my guys. And you literally dribbled through them. Oh, that was my. Yeah. And Jeff and Gundy on the broadcast is like, I think that's the best <laughs> move I've ever seen. <laughs> it didn't make any sense because uh, one, you all those two guys that are out there, they're like in one section of the court, right at the top of the key, and then there's four of us like above the uh, three point line. So just so much traffic, and Bogus swings it to, or I think Draymond swung it to me, and Bogus set like this weird screen. And I just, you just go into autopilot. Like you have no, I, I did, I know there was four people there, but you don't like every move I did was perfect. <laughs> and I did, it just came off, went between behind and like CP tried to swipe at yeah. it and I didn't even feel him. And to all that point, like you see, my favorite thing is coach Kerr was trying to instill like discipline in our offense and always move it, get, you know, good shot to great shot and the whole deal. So I do this whole move and they got, they got the camera on him and he's like, as I'm turning around to shoot, because Clay's wide open on the right wing, and I'm the right play is to kick it to him, but I'm just an autopilot, and I make it, and he walks back to the bench, and uh, and actually Draymond's behind me, and he's pointing at Clay, <laughs> like pass it, <laughs> pass it to him. Uh, so somebody sent me that clip afterwards, and when Jeff said that, I was crying, laughing on the on the way home. <laughs> he said that might be the <laughs> that might be the greatest move I've ever seen. <laughs> My two favorite plays, selfishly, <laughs> the first one is the fact that I was on the court, but I was not one of the guys that you dribbled through. I was yeah, in the corner guarding Harrison, <laughs> and I was like, oh, shit. Second part of that was any rational human being, and I mean this sincerely, like any rational human being that would be willing to try a move like that and dribble through four people and then safely make it through <laughs> that obstacle course with their back turned to the basket would pick the ball. up. <laughs> Thank God they didn't turn it over and move the ball. And, move and you were willing to double down. <laughs> you were willing to double down. And you mentioned creativity earlier. And I've said this about you. I, I, I mean this like as an observer, um, I've never, I have not seen a basketball player consistently get to a flow state better than you is there are there exercises you do you do is it is it your training like how are you able to capture that we talked about the look away shot that's being yeah. in the flow state right yeah not many people ever get to that you get to that so consistently i mean 
You got some, some proprietary information right now. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like most of it I is I feel just, like Brandon Pink. Uh, give me this. <laughs> like, he's he's going to clip the hell out of this. Because <laughs> I was where I was going. Because um, a part of the training, and anybody who's watched me train in the summers or you know, how I approach um, even in-season skill work and all that, like there's a level of obsession about the details um, when it comes to footwork, when it comes to balance, when it comes to you know, how the ball is entering the bat, like the rim at the right angle arc and all that type of stuff. There's a legit, you know, obsession around that. And I feel like that's been developed over the course of my life, but also, you know, year two in the league where I really understood the, the unlock that can be there in terms of, um, one, it, it like you said, kind of, uh, being creative about how I can play visualizing you know stuff that maybe i've never done before and then trying it in in a in a skill session or practice or whatnot um that confidence that comes behind that is just it's intoxicating and then you get in the game and you kind of lose yourself in that and then you go back to the drawing board and you keep doing that over and over and over again and i'm in my 14th year and i'm still doing it and so it's that old like cliche like no shot i've you know tried in in the game i haven't tried in practice before pretty it's pretty accurate like i might even have had four cones four guys around to do that move but i've done that dribble combination before um yeah maybe you said the word autopilot and i thought that was super interesting where something like that appears to be spontaneous for sure and it's muscle memory yeah. and it's um you've gotten your body and your mind connected before in that in that regard and then it comes out when when the lights are bright so uh, you know, like you said, my guy B Payne's had a lot to do with that in terms of taking my work ethic and my willingness to, you know, get in the gym and push the envelope, um, being creative with me on that front. Even now, uh, got a guy Carl Bergstrom who's helped me work on my body and get strong, um, work on my core, all the things that can take my game to the next level at the biggest stages in the playoffs when things slow down and you get, into that physical tug of war match out there. So it's always a continued reiteration, which is why I still feel like in my 14th year, I'm still getting better, still getting more efficient, um, and find ways to improve, even though, you know, history says you should be going the other way. So, um, yeah, that, I, I, I say flow, like flow state and like just being in that flow is exactly, you know, how it's where I want to be. And when you're in that, it's, there's no, there's no better feeling. The the other Clippers play we wanted to bring up was uh, you dropping Chris CP. Yeah. Uh, How do you feel about that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I only I only laugh because I love CP. I we go way back to our North Carolina days, and it's funny because you know, when I got drafted, I spent the whole summer with CP working out. Um, he took me around. I went on a family reunion with him to Disney World. And we were working out leading up to my rookie year. Um, so he, he showed me, he, he was one of the guys that actually showed me what it meant to like work hard in the league. You, you think, you know, until you don't know. And then you get somebody to show you and it's like, Oh, that's where I got, okay, I got you. That's where I got to get to. So he was, he was the first one to kind of demonstrate that for me. But then I got into that, uh, <laughs> that play. It's funny because how y'all used to guard me. Like I always was trying to come off the, the, the first drag screen and just pull up. And CP was so loud every possession, like, get up, get up. He was yelling at Blake or DeAndre to get up on the screen so I couldn't shoot. And every time he played you, I was like so frustrated because I, I knew I could get to that shot against pretty much every other team, but y'all would not let me do it. So that play, I hear CP yelling, get up, get up. So I like come off and DeAndre's kind of on my hip and he lets me go. And another autopilot move, like I just, you kind of go into it. And then I saw him, I saw him fall. And then you know the pressure. I don't know when you dropped me, if you felt the pressure that you had to make the shot. <laughs> you had to make the shot. But I felt that too. But I tried to keep a stone face. Because when it went in, I had to run back like nothing happened. And I saw my bench, the whole bench go crazy. But uh CV was a <laughs> he was a soldier on that front. He, I think he texted me, I was like, Yeah, you got me on that. <laughs> for him to for him to acknowledge it was was hilarious though. Well again, like I said, I didn't actually make a move. <laughs> I just I just drove a close out. So it wasn't that Good I was like discipline it wasn't, basketball. No, it, was, yeah, exactly. it wasn't that I was that I was like, oh, I dropped Steph. I gotta I gotta make the shot. It was more like out of my peripheral, I was like, did he just fall? <laughs> 
to just oh shit <laughs> you know? uh, the shot was already in the air it was in the air um the 15 finals it's something i've wanted to ask you about a long time <clears throat> and we've talked to iggy about this um when he was on the pod a couple years ago um number one did you feel like you deserved MVP in that finals? And number two, as sort of the one missing piece of the resume for the for the haters on Twitter, for the the, the narrator, you know, the narrators on Twitter, um, how much did that sort of fuel you, motivate you, bother you up until this past season? Um, so the, the question I feel like do I deserve it for sure. Because I feel like uh, comparison was that was a, was the saying comparison is a thief of thief joy. Of joy. Right? It's another Jeff Van Gundy quote. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I feel like when you're in like that was kind of what I was kind of talking about earlier. When you get into that finals, you don't understand the magnitude of the narrative, right? You don't really. F- and then when it's about you, you it's there's no better lesson than being in it, and so. That two weeks felt like a, a, an eternity from game one going to overtime and winning, Kyrie getting hurt to game two, the, the whole Del Vadova experience. And, you know, that started the narrative of, you know, our little back and forth. Braun was playing out of his mind. Then we go to Cleveland, we're down 2 1. And it's like, oh, you're comparing, you know, my stats to other NBA or other MVPs in the finals, other finals MVPs. Uh, and you, get to game three, four, or four, five, six, and we, we win three in a row and, and win the series. And Andre in his defense and his presence and that adjustment we made and in the middle of the series, unlocking another level for us and him playing out of his mind. Braun's still having crazy stats, but like it's just the power of the narrative is it, it can distract you from what the actual goal is, right? So I felt like obviously we're not winning the finals if I don't play the way that I played. I felt like I played extremely well. We don't win the finals unless Andre plays, you know, the way he did and um, that adjustment working and, you know, him giving us such a huge boost throughout the whole series. So we both thought we probably deserved it. I'm sure when he heard his name called, he was like, no, it's him. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and if it was me, it had been the same thing. Um, but it never, never dawned on me like I wouldn't have another opportunity to get one or the fact that he didn't deserve it. So it's kind of a, I'm not trying to, you know, run around it. It's literally that's how you, that when you're in it, if that's how we got there, um, it's kind of very, uh, it's very unique to the warrior experience. Um, even when KD wins it twice, cause it's the same kind of conversation. Like I can go home and put my head on the pillow and know like, we're not winning unless I do my job. Unless you go for 27, eight and eight <laughs> both years. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, no, you so suck, dude. You didn't win every you suck. <laughs> no, actually last year, I remember, I can't remember it. I don't know if it was before, or after game three and i actually last want to, year? I, yeah this yeah. is last year i, I want to push game three to later right? it's but <laughs> i don't know if it was before or after but i remember like there were a couple days where people like yo if the warriors win man like wiggins should get mvp <laughs> and i'm like nah man what the fuck are we doing here like he's playing great and you're right for y'all to win wiggins has to play great <laughs> what the are we doing here <laughs> <laughs> it's it's amazing i don't know if was it like this uh you know, back in the uh, Lakers dynasty days or the MJ dynasty, I don't know. I like I would love to go back in time and just relive the the build up to the series, the in between games, all the different conversations. Because uh, you get bored of hearing the same stuff, you got to kind of you also get the, wrapped up in the, the series. The, too. the legacy part of it, and right. and like the, 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 writing the, history in the, the moment. check boxes, right? Yeah, in the moment, the check box. Like I was, we were actually having this conversation earlier about you specifically and because we were we brought up last year and and, you know you winning finals mvp and i was like people want to put steph and kevin and braun like this is where they rank all time and i'm like dude steph's 34 (laughs) he's averaging a career high can we wait like five years and just see what happens it's like uh the funny one i hear now is you say I hear everything. It's like in my top ten in, in the history of the game, right? That's the conversation. And it's like, oh, if I win that Finals MVP, like, oh, it, it helps. It's, but everybody has their list and all that. And then going into this season, is he top ten in the 
Who is sitting here making up like you're talking about? Who's who's sitting here at the at the at the gate of the top ten list? Like, all right, we got a check, we got a check, yeah, ah, that right there doesn't have like, that. You're just you're you're you're, you're like you say, you're writing history in the moment, and it's when you talk about it, you're either going to be all the way over here, all the way over here, and some it's always somewhere in the middle. So uh, the only thing about the, the finals MVP this year that just made me laugh was like i'll never hear that question again it kind of made me sad <laughs> it's like, i'll never hear that question again oh he didn't have a finals mvp because now i was like well i'll get another it, it, it just the the goalpost changed and that's if you're around long enough and you're playing games that matter that that's part of it is whether or not your top 10 or top four or top five or top two to your top one to your st- your stands like does does any of that matter to you <laughs> It might down the road just because, like you said, when it's all said and done and I'm not playing the game, then we can have a legit conversation around what does it actually mean to be top 10? How do you compare eras and all that stuff? Of course, like you you dedicate your life to this. Like you want to be recognized as one of the greatest. I'm not obsessed about it right now because who the the hell is making up this uh, uh, the, the, the requirement. Perk me. Yeah. It's, it's part of the other side where I get to hate on you. you know? <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. Yeah, I'm gonna have a microphone in 15 years and just pick pick my target and with other, other current guys. Do you have any uh, any favorite memories of the 24 now? Oh man, that was a wild. I'm thinking about that now. That was actually it's insane. Crazy just time. Think about 20. Like we're only what are we six right now seven nine. we're 16 games in the amount of uh team meetings we've had the amount of d- drama has been around our, we haven't won a road game like all this other stuff as it currently stands hopefully when you see this we, we've won a game <laughs> but hopefully when this comes out you, you, will, <laughs> you will have beaten houston <laughs> a part of it is like that's a long time to hold, like coming off a championship to hold down like this level of excellence uh 20 like eight more games and we still haven't lost. It's, it's, it's wild to wrap your mind around, but we were still in that kind of F you mentality to the whole league because people were talking trash about our, our, our first championship and, you know, all the injuries and all that, like all the, the, the narratives that came out of that. So we were kind of, uh, we were more motivated than ever. But I think the, the, the memory that I got is just when it ended because we, we played, uh, Boston. I had a Boston Milwaukee back to back game twenty four and twenty five. Boston game went to double overtime. We ended up winning. We got to the hotel in Milwaukee at like four in the morning. I had a, the quickest turnaround ever. We get to the uh, the arena in Milwaukee and they have twenty four and one shirts <laughs> like in the stands for their uh, whatever that section that they have uh, that goes nuts. And they had twenty four and they're just chanting it the whole game. And it's like. That's really not a. It's really not a dig. <laughs> it's not what you think it is. <laughs> like I actually took one home after yeah, the game. I was like, "Yeah, I appreciate it." Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, the teams are twenty four and one at one point, so appreciate y'all for uh, calling it out. But they ended up winning. Obviously, we were we were a little uh, we were a little slow in that. But twenty four and zero was crazy. Think about it. on the on the reflection piece. How do you contextualize or think about two thousand sixteen? Because it, it was. Again, as a as a peer, a competitor, as a now observer, and someone who has to talk about these things, it was one of the most magical seasons in NBA history. Sure. You guys go seventy three and nine. You get to the finals again. You have a unanimous MVP season. You take this jump too in sixteen, where you were great in fifteen, MVP, all that. Like you were the best player on the best team. Like, but there's a jump that you made in sixteen. How do you sort of contextualize that year as part of your career? It, it comes with a lot of uh, emotions, right? You, I mean, you just explained it really well. The seventy-three and nine chase, you're starting twenty-four and zero, coming off a championship, getting everybody's best shot, and still winning. Uh, I don't know at what point we started to even talk about seventy-three and nine. I'm trying to like it was probably right after the All Star break. You start to think about oh, if we win, you know, seven out of eight games just the rest of the way we're gonna get there and then it became uh a huge talking point probably the last 20 games and we carried that all the way through and actually got it done i remember that game set uh 82 two games going on at the same time us playing memphis chasing the 73rd win meanwhile in, in la it was 
uh, Kobe's last game, uh, playing against Utah and scoring 60, whatever he did. So just NBA was at its, at its height. Uh, and then we go through the playoff run and I actually here at, the, in Houston, I've slipped on the floor and busted my knee. Was out for however long and then come back and game six play was born, um, in OKC. Then you get to the finals and you're up three one and you're already kind of counting, you know, the win is like, oh, we'll just get it done. Draymond suspension, all that. It kind of is a little distraction, but you're like, we're still right there. Like, we're about to be two time like defending champs back to back and the whole vibe. Um, and know how it ended. What I, what I say about that three one situation is, I've never seen two guys play at that level for three straight for three play, straight games. It's the craziest thing I've ever yeah. seen. Like Bron and Cook Kyrie were just on. Like we play well, they just play better, and it was, it was. It was hard to watch and be in that vibe where you couldn't do anything about it. And, uh, you know, we still had an opportunity to win game five and seven down the stretch. And then the, the Kevin Love possession, which is one of my, like, if there's like one play, like, I know I should have done something different. It's that one. Um, it was like, there's way more, uh, there's way more time on the clock than I thought. Me trying to answer Kyrie's three over me was kind of, in my head and you know you force up a shot and you kind of lose momentum and they they win on your home floor uh but you can always tip your hat to somebody who just outplayed you and that's what they did for three straight games so the whole season was was insane to think about all the experiences we had the fact that we have a 73 and 9 banner in our practice facility but no uh nba finals banner that year still hurts but uh you know, it's part of the part of the journey. And every time I see Kyrie, every time I see Brian, like there's that respect of, you know, those, those five years were crazy or four years playing against them were crazy. Um, just fast forward to 17. I think game one of 2017 was the best basketball that's ever been played. Like on both sides, everybody was at peak form. Um, it was it was the most intense, most exhilarating game I've ever played in. It was the first game of the final. So. Uh, all that stuff you remember uh, pretty vividly. That run, how exhausting was that? that did it that take year? its Did it take its toll? No, did that whole that five year oh, stretch? Oh yeah, just playing because I think again I did one finals I didn't win a chip, but I just remember it was like playoffs different, yeah. second round different, conference finals. Different. different then you got finals break. super bowl mm-hmm. <laughs> like super bowl and you guys did that five straight <laughs> years <laughs> Brian did it nine straight years right is that eight, right eight, eight straight yeah eight, eight straight years yeah. with with three different teams but eight straight years so yeah uh it brought the best out of us i, I call it exhausting for sure but it, you always met the moment like you and you you surprise yourself at what you can kind of stir up in terms of that competitive energy the fact that over those five years, uh, I think we played over a hundred playoff games. So we played more than a season than anybody who didn't make the playoffs those five years. It's just, and that's not just the actual games, but the intensity is, you know, two, three times what it is in a regular season. The preparation, the mental focus you got to have, which you put your body through all that. But we always met the moment. So that it, it begs the question, like, after 2019 finals, Katie gets hurt, Clay gets hurt, we lose to Toronto. Then that next fall, I get hurt, I break my hand, miss that season. We had the COVID season, and then we come back and and win this year. Like, did we need that break? And it's a hard question to ask. I felt like we could have kept, if everybody was healthy, we could have kept meeting that moment, meeting that level. Uh, but it also, it did help. Like to have a nice little, you know, restart and, and figure out what was necessary to get back to that level. Um, but yeah, it's crazy to think about just the games that you played, the, uh, the competition and the intensity of those games on the court. Um, and how you surprise yourself and what you can kind of bring, you know, to the table and, uh, you know, throughout that journey. Um, a lot of people, players included 
coaches, you know, fans, of course, do this a lot. But when you add a piece to a team or they make, you know, a team makes a trade and all of a sudden there's a, you know, a, a media day photo of three players and you see, and it's like, oh, it's scary. You know, I think Harden said scary hours or that team's going to be scary. <laughs> My favorite. <laughs> Whenever I think of the KD Warriors, I think of Spencer Hawes because this dude, when we're playing cards, anytime he has a good hand, he always says, Y'all are so fucked. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I'm I'm thinking about like y'all getting KD and coming off what you've just done the prior two years and just being like, man, y'all are so fucked. I got a I got a funny story for that. So that summer, KD's we it was what July first, whatever. I think maybe three, four weeks after that. Uh, Drake was performing at Oracle. So we go to the concert and it's one of those like situations where stage is up here. We're kind of back here in like the little VIP section, whatever. It's like me and Draymond. I think Katie was there. Um, we're all kind of just, I mean, nobody, nobody, everybody knows we're there, but it's not like a big deal. It's just freaking Drake. So Drake's performing and he gets on this, uh, like, I don't even know what's like a, uh, a lift that takes him around the arena so you can kind of see the fans and have that moment. <clears throat> so as he's going around, he sees us down there, but he doesn't really acknowledge it. He goes past and he's like, oh, we're in Oracle Arena. It's crazy. Y'all the champs. Know it's a tough year. Man, y'all got, y'all got Steph, Draymond, KD now. Oh, uh, uh, number 11. <laughs> <laughs> So we all start laughing. It was like he he was just in the moment. My brother was with us, so Seth's with us. And after we get in the car on the way home, he's like, "Man, man, y'all cheating because <laughs> the fact that Drake didn't know Clay's name, <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> he's like, y'all had so many names. <laughs> that was my favorite. Like Seth just acknowledging that, like that vibe that you talking about with Spencer. He's like, bro, the fact that he went through the whole roster and got to uh, Clay was like, uh." <laughs> Number eleven, it's like game six. That's player. amazing. <laughs> I was laughing. What was the basket when he got there? We've talked about this with him a bit. We talked about Draymond too. But when he got there at first, having just been through these wars against him, what was like the basketball fit like immediately? Like pre pre playoffs. Those are the conversations that we talked about because I mean, he even said it just recently. Like you put me with anybody, I can play with anybody. Uh, there's a lot of other context, but like that's who how he plays. Um, we knew that going in, there was going to be a little sacrifice trying to figure out where shots were going to go. Funny part is we always thought like Draymond's such a great playmaker, point forward type vibe. Uh, I was like a 17, 18 shots. Clay was about the same. Katie was like right around 20. So you're counting up the shots in a game and like who's going to have to make the biggest sacrifice. And at first it was actually me because I was, Draymond was making, he was a playmaker and I loved this, you know, set off ball screens and run around and use the gravity and all that. We were creating great shots, but I would, I didn't have a natural flow on the offensive end until probably after Christmas, you know, the Christmas day game. So, but a lot of the confidence that we can figure it out is because we all knew how to play basketball. We had a, you know, a high IQ. Nobody really needed to be ball dominant. Um, and so. It would mesh pretty well, and we had a lot of confidence that we could do that. Um, and then you go through the season, you, you figure it out. Uh, funny part is, it's kind of like last year where you have this idea of what our peak basketball is, but KD got hurt the last two months of that season, or six, maybe six, eight weeks of that season. And uh, he came back right before the playoffs. So we had to go into the most important time of the year without like having those reps. And so you still have a little bit of uncertainty around how it's going to look. I felt really bad for you guys. <laughs> I was trying. I was trying. I was <laughs> <laughs> you knew as soon as you started. Like, like, come In on, our man. locker room, we were trying to figure it out. No, I'm just playing. It, but that's like part of the. Uh, <laughs> 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 uh, come on. <laughs> We were trying to figure it out, and thankfully we did. Oh, man. <laughs> My favorite, I was laughing at first when you first started talking about guys adding up shots, because I remember, I remember, I don't know if it was like September or media day or sometime in the preseason, 
but they ask Clay about it, about like sacrificing. It's like, are you worried you're not going to get him as many shots? And Clay's like, I ain't sacrificing shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm shooting 20 times a game. <laughs> Yeah. Like, that's that's clay that's yeah. clay baby <laughs> you don't ride an elevator for the music or pick an airline for the movies so when it comes to audio entertainment it makes sense to choose audible it's the home for stories told by the biggest stars like ethan hawk carrie washington and kevin hart it's home to epic adventures chilling mysteries and can't miss comedies audible is the home of storytelling let your imagination soar with audiobooks, podcasts, and originals. You know what I love most about Audible? No matter where I am, my imagination can run wild with an action-adventure story, the journey to your best self, the spider web of true crimes, and discover new worlds, old worlds, and how to make a better world. Audible is the home of storytelling with all your audio entertainment in one app. Find the best of what you love or something new to discover. Audible is an incredible selection of audiobooks across every genre, from bestsellers and new releases to celebrity memoirs, mysteries, and thrillers, motivation, wellness, business, and more. As an Audible member, you can choose one title a month to keep from their entire catalog, including the latest bestsellers and new releases. Members also get full access to a growing selection of included audiobooks, Audible originals, and podcasts. You can download or stream our included titles all you want. Right now, I'm listening to The Nature of the Game by Mike Kaiser. Everybody knows I love golf. Mike Kaiser built Band and Dunes as well as a number of other courses. It's been a fascinating listen. Let Audible help you discover new ways to laugh, be inspired, or be entertained. New members can try it free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash old man or text old man to 500-500. That's audible.com slash old man or text old man to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Audible.com slash old man. <laughs> uh, um, the culture of the Warriors. And culture is this buzzword in the NBA. Uh, execs use it a lot. Coaches, players, everybody talks about culture. And Steve, is, Steve has talked about it. And recently with the Draymond Jordan thing, um, he called it, a, I think, the biggest crisis uh, when Katie's last year with Draymond. Uh, you know, that was a crisis. I'm sure there are other ones that aren't public. I'm, I'm sure there was stuff that happened early on with Steve as you guys are figuring them out. But your your guy's culture, the fabric of that, has never torn. And I have this theory about superstars and this is not a knock on any other superstar i've played with but there's a few anomalies to me i think you i think Jokic, i think i think uh Giannis, tim duncan's was was this way like it's great to have culture drivers like patty mills but ultimately if your superstar is the main guy driving the culture that's kind of the reason the culture doesn't break am i off base on that no, I mean, I, not having been around those other guys, um, I think you're right. You're right on, on, on it in terms of just understanding that what's expected of me every night performance wise, uh, the lead by example type where, uh, it's a little out of context, but what Michael said about, or MJ said in his documentary about not expecting anybody else or to, do something he wouldn't necessarily do on the court and the work and all that. Like there's an element of that. There's an element of awareness of the value of everybody in the locker room. Like, yeah, the narrative might be, this is my team and you're carrying this load and where would they be without you? I coach does an amazing job from the first day he came in preaching this, the strength in numbers, you know, tagline, but I try to communicate as often as possible how much I need everybody in the locker room to perform and do the, play their role and that we'll all get proper acknowledgement throughout the process um, because that's how I, I see things and how I try to live it out on a daily basis. And I feel like that goes a long way for the guys that either have come into our our uh, our team like the JaVale McGee's and uh, Nick Young's and um, Zaza Pachulia's and the guys that are kind of the glue pieces and, and have been around, but haven't won. And they come in and they see how we operate. 
Um, and they believe in what we're doing, believe in how I, uh, how my leadership style. Like I'm not the most vocal guy running in like mother effing people in the locker room or having to dominate, you know, whole court every day, but it's a, uh, it's what Draymond's for. <laughs> exactly. And we have a great kind of you know, chemistry on that front. Um, cause the things he needs to say that I can't really communicate in the same or articulate in the same way, but there's a level of walking that out and doing it on a daily basis that that's my job. And, you know, the, the confidence that that builds for everybody, uh, throughout, throughout a season. So, yeah, I, I, uh, acknowledge the role. I respect it. Um, and win or lose, like you really understand the dynamic that I can go out and drop 40 every night. And you're not going to win shit unless you have guys that play their role and actually believe in, what they're doing um because that stuff is very fragile in the league because there's a lot of different distractions that can kind of creep in on that yeah i look at i look at a, a part of a coach's role in the nba obviously the x's and o's dealing with the media um certainly dealing with star players but having the 15th guy have and this is this is not only the role of the coach but this is the role of the star player as well i think Having the fifteenth guy feel a sense of ownership in the team, having a, the fifteenth guy feel empowered, and it's hard to do, man. And you got to have the right guys to do it. But and that's where you guys have, I think, done a great job. You consistently brought in those glue guys, and but it, it's hard to do. And what you guys have have built is, um, I mean, beyond just the talent, like what you've built culture wise is remarkable. Did you see, by the way? The um, the p- people on Twitter that were questioning your leadership when you had your hands on your shorts. No, I missed this one. Uh-oh. When I when I had my this hit. was a thing. When the video got leaked. When the video got oh leaked. the Draymond thing? yeah. <laughs> Did you see this? <laughs> no, but I'm trying to. But this go is another back to thing the moment. where I'm like, what are we fucking doing here, guys? <laughs> People say anything though. This, like, this is what we're talking about. Because I didn't intercede. I had my hands on my shorts, so I didn't. I, I didn't. I, I, didn't I, res- guess, I didn't respond quick enough. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I mean, I mean, whatever it was, dude. I don't know. <laughs> but part of it, yeah. I mean, yeah. I guess uh, you're liable to. I actually didn't hear that one, which was which. Oh, thank God, because that was that was some me stuff. Off. All right, that would piss me <laughs> off. But a part of it is, yeah, you're gonna be in that situation where you get critiqued about every single thing. Um, even there's one I've uh during the season when I broke my hand, uh Draymond was the only one of the court that was still playing. And there was a play, I can't remember what it was, somebody airballed a shot or something. I'm standing up like trying to like be supporter. But he airballed it and I like my face just went stale and I'm just staring like what the hell is going on? <laughs> but I kind of froze and the camera's just on me the whole time. So then they put me like, Oh, I am embarrassed with his the, the Warriors and the state of the Warriors right now. This uh you know, just kind of trying to put me against the team in terms of like, oh, Mr. High Mighty over here and this on the on the court. And it's like those situations the culture has to take precedent over everything else because they're gonna try to poke. They're gonna try to position you in certain ways um just because the opportunity is there so i got to be aware of all of that too when we when we had iggy on um last year he was talking we were talking about some of your crazy in-game shots and he was basically we were like running through a bunch of them and we've we've hit on some of them already but he was talking about you in practice and he was like you guys don't understand like steph in practice like this kind of shit you do in practice is is at a so much crazier level than anything you've done is there anything that stands out to you in terms of like you did this and maybe there's not even video of it or anything like that but it's just a, it's like particularly memorable there's i mean the joke is it's kind of an everyday thing where you just try random stuff you know shooting like one hand slingers from 94 feet that i've made and like called it uh like we'll bring in the huddle, whatever, and you're like walking towards half court and you stole behind your back and it goes in. There was one during uh open practice our last season at Oracle, so twenty eighteen, nineteen season, and we were doing our normal warm up stuff and the fans are in there and the whole deal. And coach is talking on the PA system and all that and we like bring it in to go do some warm ups and stuff and I was at half court and I just the ball kinda came at me and I just picked it up and threw it behind my head and it went in. 
Like nobody else is watching. There's a video of this one. Yeah, that yeah one. I've that's, seen that's, this, that's this video my favorite one just because yeah. like I the shot and I make it and I you see my reaction like watch out <laughs> and Quinn Cook's right there and like we're jumping up and down. But nobody else on the team had any idea what was going on. It's just my little. It doesn't make any moment. sense. <laughs> there's, no, there's no world where this should go. So, in. Little stuff like that. Uh, but like I told him, is whatever. I mean, we're in the gym all freaking day and practice, and whether it's summer training or you know practice shoot arounds, games, and all that, you're gonna try stuff just because you know I still have fun playing basketball. Like that for me is the thing that I hope to never ever lose. Um, no matter all this drama of the business and wins and losses and all that. Like I still get lost in the game and when you have a ball in your hands. It's just a different energy that I have. And I want to keep that for as long as I can. I, I do love the joy that NBA players get from making stupid shots. Like it's, act, it doesn't actually make sense. You're still kids, man. You're, like, you're, <laughs> kids, you're literally just kids. We're like, just kids <laughs> playing a game. That's all it is. That's all it is. Bill Russell used to say that. Like he, he, uh, he could never really rationalize the the business of the NBA because he's like, this is literally grown kids getting paid to play a game, and that was his perspective, which protected him from all the other st stuff that was going on in society at the time, and just rationalizing like, why is he in this situation? Um, I think it's a healthy kind of perspective because it it uh, it reminds you of how blessed you are to be doing what you're doing. It reminds you, you know. There's so many other things that you can't control in this league and you know, injuries and uh, whatever the, the case is in terms of what the, what's going on with the team and all that. But you're playing basketball, man. Like, yeah. It's it's mad fun. The benefit to uh, to players in today's NBA is that everybody has a camera and every arena has cameras in it and the tracking. So you you don't really miss shots made. My rookie, I don't know if they did this when your rookie year, my rookie year, whenever shoot around with it, everybody would kick the ball as oh, far yeah. as they could <laughs> up into the stands. And then you'd have to go retrieve the balls. Yeah. So Turk had a pretty decent leg. I'm going to be honest with you. He didn't make upper bowl? But he didn't make upper bowl, oh, okay. but he made second bowl. Okay. So we're in Detroit, second bowl, and I go chase it. I throw all the other balls back and I go chase it. And they're like, shoot it. Shoot it. I'm like, I can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm fucking. I was like, all right, I'll shoot it. <laughs> and I, uh, I'm like at half court in the second deck and I take the ball. And I mean, you know, I play baseball. I can throw the ball. So I just, I threw it one handed as far as I could. And I was like, oh shit, that's going in. <laughs> and it okay, swished shit. in with such force. And it's a regret of mine that there was not caught exactly. on camera. This is 2006. <laughs> like it, it, it didn't, there's no video evidence of it. Uh, um, before we let you go, game four of the past finals in 2022, this past year, um, as someone who has watched you uh, be a uh, kind of like a dickhead on the court with your antics and all your your celebrations, like in a in a no no in no a loving I, way, I get no no yeah. no no you don't have yeah. to you don't have to yeah. sugarcoat that because that's part of the so, so I know you're gonna get to that question, but people ask me there's a bo there's a fine line between confidence and cockiness, right? Yes, and you just like dickhead in terms of my reactions and mannerisms and all yeah. that. Like I'm sure that's uh, how people interpret it. Yeah, you know, the same, and then obviously the Warrior fans are like, oh, he's just he's just have pure joy having fun, <laughs> like. <laughs> It's just, he's just expressing himself so you get both sides of it but it's amazing like it's, it's just authentic in terms of me just enjoying myself out there i get it's gonna be it, it probably is it's just this dickhead behavior <laughs> uh, a lot of the time even the turnaround shots where you're like looking at people yeah uh, wow. while balls in there. but anyway sorry go ahead no i'm glad you clarified that. <laughs> you, yeah, don't you sure, recognize don't, that don't there, is, there is a line and oh, you're always fuck, you're always telling the line which side um but I, I don't remember you ever so showing sort of the, not the the joyful antics, but the the emotional antics. I don't ever remember watching you show that in the first quarter of a game. And you did that in game four. Why? Why? Um, you're right. That was kind of an intentional way I approached that game specifically because... Um, it's kind of the the through line of the last three years, and you know, watching 
you know, injuries happen to my teammates, myself, go through a year where you hear all the doubts of we'll never be back there at that level. Um, just to fight to make the play in tournament the year before, uh, and what it took to give ourselves some life. And then fast forward to last season where you believe you can get there, but you really don't, you don't know because it's a new crop of guys. It's, you know, the older version of us. Um, and there's just a lot of question marks. And then you stay in the moment, plot your way through it, play at a high level, get to the finals. Um, and I have so much experience in that setting. Obviously, you know, that was the, um, the six one and it was different because it was Boston. It was in that hostile environment. Um, and it was different because we were tested in a way that, it, you know, was, was new. And, uh, a lot of it was, you know, the protect, like the core we had, like we have so much trust in what we all bring to the table. And when you see this fan base, would not like go at one of your guys and like constantly just berate him and cross the line and do all that, you know, type of stuff. And, um, we lose game three and you're in that environment. It's like, like, holy shit, like this is going to be a dog fight. Like we knew that going in, but this was a different element of emotional like response that we hadn't really, you know, seen before. So <clears throat> game four is like one, you know how big the game is. You lose that game. Well, first off, we were already, according to ESPN, we were already 84% uh, underdogs in the, uh, in the final. So now go down 3-1. You might as well just, you might as well not even play after that. So you know how big the game is. <clears throat> but then you get into that, um, into the first quarter and we're already down, I think like 12-4 or something like that. Um, we slowly gain some momentum. And I think we were down. I don't know. I hit that one shot and I started like yelling at the crowd. I was like, this is going to be a different motherfucking game. I, I said that I had my, my mama got mad at me because of my word choice. And I was like, oh, you're right. But I was just unleashing a different level of, <clears throat> um, like I'm here, like we're here and y'all ain't going to just have this, uh, you ain't going to count the parade already in terms of, you know, the 19,000 people that seemed to be in unison on what they were saying every single uh, possession. Like it was like, we're here and we're going to respond and, you know, see what happens. And a lot of people talk about just the way that we play, like it's free flowing and it's poetic and there's a lot of movement and, you know, high level skill and all that, but you got to have, you know, that we have the most competitive guys. Draymond complimented Clay. Clay's like one of the most competitive guys that I've ever played with because he, he wants it so bad. And, uh, Draymond the same. I'm, I'm the same. Andre's the same. And so just required another, another level of response from us. For me, I wanted to lead that, even though we were still down in the first quarter. I was like, I don't know really what I'm talking about, but let's go. And, uh, it kind of manifested a, a three game one that, a three great three game run that was for the books. Um, and game four was definitely my favorite game of my career because of the stakes that were a part of it. And the fact that, you know, we lose that game. Who knows if we ever, you know, have a chance to win a championship again. We were, we were talking earlier about, um, you breaking Ray's record at MSG last year. Have you had a chance? It's been obviously there's been so much going on. Have you had a chance to have just like a little bit of perspective on that, but then also just on how you've sort of changed the game overall? And, and a lot of people have commented on this over the years, but it's it's an objectively true thing, but it's also like you're living it. Yeah. So you might not be able to sort of look at it while you're sort of in the middle of it. A little bit more wisdom's come since I've been in my thirties where I understand like this isn't gonna be around. I'm not gonna be able to play forever. Um, you get a little bit more reflective, I think, in terms of all the things that have gone into your success, the way that uh the game has changed and the fact that when I got into the league, like that was never a, a goal. It was just I play the game the way that I play, I stretch the envelope and have a different level of creativity and you start to shoot from deeper, build your range out. You add the ball handling and shot and space creation and all that stuff to it. And then you start to see teams be designed differently. You start to see guys that never really prioritize three point shooting go to the lab in the summer and try to add it to their game. And then every coach is like, no, not, not, not yet. Just <laughs> hold on to that. But, uh, everybody's like really opening up their mind to what that could look like for them. 
Um, then you got guys, you know, like what Dame's doing, what Trey Young, how he plays. You know, there's similarities in terms of like what you see inspires you to either add some form of it to your game or open up the possibility, like, hey, that, I can do that too, kind of vibe. So, um, I'm a little bit more reflective on that, and it, it's it's really it's really dope. But I never let it get too far because, like you said, I'm still. Um, I'm still in it and still feel like there's <clears throat> another level to get to. Efficiency for me is always the the biggest thing. Like how how long can I keep up this volume and efficiency balance that um I I I obsess over a lot. So you do. Uh, yeah. Seventy percent true shooting percent. <laughs> I don't even know what that even means. <laughs> like the I know the number, I don't know how they <laughs> it's the just analytics behind it is like two pointers. <laughs> Three pointers. And three I just know if it's above sixty five, you're doing something good. <laughs> if you're if you're the first, if you're the guy though, what are you seeing? Because you said you ultimately become what you see. Like I think there is a Dame is more your contemporary, but I think there's there's a lineage to from you to Trey, right? Who was that lineage prior to you? It was combining Steve Nash and Reggie Miller as like players. That was exactly. Like, I, I love watching him play, but when I got to high school and then my first year at Davidson, it was, can you be as lethal with the ball in your hand as you can with it without the ball or vice versa? And those two guys are like the models of like watching Nash just be a pick and roll master and all the different passes he would make, this tight handle, and he wasn't the most athletic guy. Like I could resonate with that. Reggie you know, played against my dad. So every time he played against him, I just, you know how you watch the game and you can only watch one guy and your eyes, I can't watch anything. If Reggie was on the court, I could not watch anything else. I just watched everything he did, his angles he took, the deception, the wild push-offs he'd have and he'd run the other way. Like all that stuff, uh, I was just a fan of and I, it became pretty clear when I understood my skill set that I could have meshed those two guys as like a baseline of how I wanted to play and then take it from there um, throughout your career and kind of building or hanging your hat on, on that style of play. Um, because I feel like I am as lethal off the ball, obviously, as I, as I am with, with it in my hands. Uh, that's what separates you from every other. I said this actually last night on the Broadport podcast. I was like, <laughs> there's a lot of great shooters. Instead, you're the best shooter ever, but like there's a lot of great shooters. And then there's like you, cause you, do everything that every other dominant good player does, and you shoot the ball great. You know, you're 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 you can ISO, you can play at a pick and roll, you can be a facilitator, you rebound at a high level, you guard at a high level. That's, I mean, I couldn't do any of those things. You know, I couldn't. I'm sorry, I could. I could shoot. <laughs> <laughs> I could shoot. Uh, we could probably do another hour and a half, but you got a game tomorrow. We do appreciate the time. Anytime, uh, this has been awesome, man. Really, really great. I just Thank having you. to walk by the room. I just heard you in here. I didn't know we had a, we had a point. <laughs> <laughs> the weird coincidence. Is that JJ's voice? <laughs> we ended up in Houston somehow. <laughs> All right. Appreciate it, bro. Absolutely. <laughs>